Hello, we're gonna to start today's video with a story. I want you to imagine a young, gorgeous British man who was kind of lost in the world, young, and didn't really know what to do with his life, and ended up stumbling across the Atlantic and ended up working on a summer camp in Massachusetts. You are looking at that person. Yes, I ended up working on a Girl Scout summer camp in a place called Ashland, Massachusetts, USA, and it was the best time of my life. I didn't realize it was a Girl Scout camp. I went to London to this huge event where you could go and work and volunteer. Slave labor, maybe. But it was an incredible experience. I know it's hard to believe, but this was me working as a lifeguard on a summer camp. Uh, kids would come during the day. It was a day camp. They'd come on the yellow bus. In fact, I would catch that and would have the evenings and weekends free doing drive-in cinemas. It was an amazing experience. Some of the guys that did the overnight camps, residential for two weeks, where the kids, they had to help them at three in the morning if they wet themselves. They looked absolutely exhausted in the airport on the way home. I knew one guy that was working in the kitchens and he was like peeling potatoes most of the time in like insane heat. So I got pretty lucky. And when I was working on this Girl Scout camp, I discovered Girl Scout cookies, which so a British person like me might be like, what the heck is that? It's quite self-explanatory because they are cookies created by like the Girl Scout brand. I believe it started in something like 1910 or something like that. Where a Girl Scout and her mum came up with a cookie recipe, did like a cookie sale and it ended up raising money for their particular clan. I forget what they called it. But then it just kind of evolved from there and then more and more Girl Scout groups from across the USA started doing their own recipes, their own versions, doing sales, and it was a really good way of fundraising. And then they started selling them commercially. I think one of the perks of working on the summer camp was this unlimited supply of boxes of Girl Scout cookies that just kept, kept arriving. So for today's video, we're gonna do two of my favorite ones. And there's also one that I never got to try, which was more modern. However, I believe, I'm not sure if someone could let me know. I think a lot of these are now discontinued. So if we make them homemade and they taste just as good, Win-win, let's go. All right, so we're gonna do Samoa cookies first. So this is just some plain flour, baking powder going in, and a shimmy of salt. Now Samoa cookies were like absolute gold on the summer camp. They were so hard to get hold of, everyone wanted them. And as we just mix this together, hopefully you'll see why in a bit. And actually out of the three recipes, this one takes the longest today. We've got some butter here at room temperature and some sugar. So we are just gonna cream this together. So there goes that dry mixture from before. Now, actually, I think the Girl Scout cookie like brand, I think they use two different uh, bakeries. So one called them Samoas, and I can't remember what it's called. I think the other one was like caramel or something. And we'll come on to the caramel bit in a bit anyway. But it was almost like these two rival bakeries that had contracts with the Girl Scout company. I'm not quite sure where it's at at the moment. There we go. So we kind of like get into that sort of nice sort of clumpy, but almost damp biscuit dough kind of vibes, which of course, as we know in America, means something completely different, biscuit dough. No gravy on this today. Bit of milk and some vanilla. And I will just work this through and let it absorb, but this is why it takes a while because this dough needs to be chilled. You can see how sort of sticky this is, right? If we try and make cookies out of this right now, it'll just go bleh. And that is the official term, bleh. All right, so let's get this encased down. Once it's at that step, like just press down to increase the surface area. So it will chill quicker, but also it's still in quite a nice, unique shape. So uh, let's get this in the fridge. Or if you're in a real hurry, you could bung it in the freezer. I'm not gonna do that. There are, mate, you can rest on there next to some butter and a cauliflower. One thing we can do actually, we do need to get the oven going soon. This is some desiccated coconut and it gives us time now actually to watch this like a hawk. We're gonna toast it. And it's the sort of thing when you do it in the oven, you take your eye off it for a minute and it burns very, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, given that I've actually used a slightly smaller tray so it's not perfectly flat, I'm gonna have to agitate it urgh, even more and watch it like a hawk. Ah! When these people say watch it like a hawk, everyone should do that. Ah. Right, for reference, this is me agitating it, but there is some light browning occurring. This will actually show up way more when I take it out of the oven in a bit, but it's been about eight minutes so far and already some of it's catching and the bits underneath aren't, so just keep shimmying it. Why don't they sell like ready-made toasted coconut? Maybe they do and I've just been living under a rock all my life, but I can't, I've never seen that. That would be like game-changing for some scenarios. Maybe not today, but if you're a Girl Scout trying to make thousands of these things, you need some help. I've been shimmying like crazy. Look at that color. You see that? It almost looks like sand. I could have pushed it slightly more. However, the caramel, ow. <laughs> I was resting my oven gloves on my leg. The caramel that that gets blended with a bit, we'll let it cool. We'll kind of dye it anyway and mask it. But damn, that smells good. Well, we'll keep the oven on. So this dough is nice and chilled. In fact, what I might do, because it can go from being quite firm to extremely soft and sticky again very rapidly, 
I might actually just halve it. Yeah, so I can rewrap this bit and put it back in the fridge. So we're gonna roll it out nice and thin. Doesn't really matter about the shape because we're gonna be stamping now. So I actually don't have a donut cutter mold, but um, I've got, uh, well actually this is a great thing, you can make them as big as you want, a round cookie cutter here. If you had a donut cookie cutter, this would be like way easier. I've just got this bottle cap here, and I'm gonna push down, create little discs that we can just pop out. Oh my gosh, look, it's sticking already, look. Oh wow. As long as I can get a disc out, a donut disc. Oh, I ripped it. Oh, amazing. Well done, mate, well done. This is thawing so quick, I might need to put it back in the fridge. Come on, give me one, just give me one. Actually, that looks pretty good. So what I'm actually gonna do, I'm gonna gather this all together. We'll, I'll do this again, so you don't need to see this step, because look, it's just gone gummy already. It is quite a warm day today, so look at that. And what I will do is actually prepare it, rather on a floured board, we'll do it on our baking tray. All right, that's better. I've got uh, some dough that's chilled, and I think I'm gonna go a lot quicker this time. And then if I've got time to just quickly, there we go, that's better. A donut cutter would have definitely saved me a little bit of time, but I think the minute it's cold, I think when I'm filming, it just sort of slows things down a little bit. Especially if you're doing it on a warm environment, basically build it on your tray and it, you'll be fine. Made a couple more just to fill the tray up and they look like pineapple rings. And I did just put the tray back in the fridge for like another 10 minutes just to keep them a little bit more rigid. Because they feel like they just want to go Bleh. So they only need to bake for about 10 minutes. For reference, the cap that I used was on this spray. <coughs> it's like a candy spray. I think I got 10% in my mouth then. Mm. Oh, it's quite a nice sight. There is our toasted coconut in a bowl. Here is some caramel that I've got from a can. This might be a bit of a weird combo, but it's gonna hopefully bond it together. I really wanna stir this aggressively, but coconut will go everywhere. But you can start to see there's this sort of stereotypical look on a Samoa cookie where the darkness of the caramel is breaking through and sort of supporting the toasted coconut. And we've got to keep going slowly. I'm tempted to add a bit more caramel. Oh my gosh, look at that. But we want it to be kind of rigid. It needs to be able to hold its shape. So we'll keep going. Yeah, happy with that. See, we can sort of manipulate it into any shape we want. These delicate cookies, can you see the light brown color on there? Oh. It's kind of like relief that they held it together. In fact, me included. <laughs> Out of all the doughs I've ever done, this common dough, which is used in a lot of biscuit and cookie recipes, is probably one of the most fiddly ones, but it gives you like a really nice light texture. I don't know if you can just see the golden brown edges on that. Looking great. So, while I rack to one side, we'll let them cool down fully. I'm gonna transfer them over. They should cool down fairly quick because they're quite thin, but they're like a real melt in the mouth base. All right, so just while they're cooling down, these are just some dark chocolate chips. So I'm just gonna melt them in the microwave, 20 second blast, stirry, stirry, stirry. Can you keep an eye on the microwave for me, mate? Cheers, bud. So yeah, we'll get that melted, but that's actually gonna be for two purposes. That'll do nicely. Right, we're on the decorating phase now, and this will come in in a moment. In fact, let's just show one whole decorating journey so you can see, right? So we've got, well, this is now cooled down very quick, to be fair. This is a bit more caramel. We now grab our coconut mixture and sit it on top. So using the other caramel that's there to kind of fuse it together and bite it, yeah, you can really shape it here. Look at that. Oh, someone's up the door, hang on. So now this is quite important. I'm gonna use a non-slip baking mat like this, or you could do this on baking parchment, but this size tin will fit in my fridge really easy. But we're gonna dunk the bottom of it into the chocolate like this. It will set with that feet on there. And then you can get a piping bag if you want, but I'm just gonna drizzle chocolate with a fork right across like that. Oh my word. <laughs> So all we'll do is let these set in the fridge and I think we'll move on to a slightly easier cookie. I still remember the Girl Scout promise. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country to help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law. Every morning there was this flag ceremony and I didn't realize how um, passionate and actually important that was in everyday role. And there was one time when the international staff helped the kids do it and we very, very nearly dropped the American flag. It had to be carried really neat and folded a certain way. And apparently they were dead serious. I was like pretty scared if it touched the floor, we would have to do like a burning ceremony. So that was quite a hardcore introduction to the Girl Scout way of life. However, the other thing I did learn when I was over in America, that's the first time I discovered s'mores. I think now with social media, it's so much easier to discover things. Like in the UK now, everyone sort of knows what s'more is. But I remember coming back once the camp had finished and being like, hey guys, have you heard of s'mores? And I was like, what does that even mean? Speaking of which, there is a Girl Scout s'more cookie and it's only three ingredients. 
So chocolate, uh, marshmallow fluff, which is so easy to get in the UK now, it is absurd. It's not even in the American Isle anymore. <laughs> and last of all, for a proper s'more, you need to get graham crackers, which I actually called graham crackers. People were like, no, they're called graham crackers. Even Americans were arguing with each other. And I remember being an English bloke going, that's graham. And the Americans that I would base with would go, no, it's graham. Anyhow, they are quite expensive to import. They're not as easy to get hold of. So the typical uh, alternative here in the UK is some digestive biscuits. And I have to be honest, I'm gonna be completely blunt. It is not the same. It is completely, it's like you really, for that authenticity, you need to get them. So I thought, well, even if that's not authentic, I might try something a bit different, something a bit nice. And these are nice biscuits, but actually pronounced nice. There is a slight French background to these, but I won't go into it. And I just like the shape of them and they melt in the mouth. So they're slightly more softer than digestives, but I think they'll still work as a sandwich, which is what we do first. I don't know if it's just me, but anyone else that has these biscuits and they eat them and go, oh, these are nice. So I will show this just the once, I think, but very fun indeed. We are gonna take the marshmallow fluff and then we're gonna take the other biscuit, once we're fairly happy that it's evenly spread, I'm gonna press it down to just fill it out. Oh, wow. And if there's any excess like that, I might just scrape it to get it fairly flush with the biscuit. Oh, nice. I mean, nice. So we're gonna take our chocolate bowl. Oh, that's holding it well. Nice. I mean, nice, again. <laughs> and let it just sort of sit a minute, okay? So I'm gonna repeat that with a few more. So hopefully, jump cut from a completely different angle. And I've just put these in the freezer because hopefully, with a seal pack will help us here, we should be able to just peel off. There we go. That's where we poured it. So if I put them, like this, biscuit side up, yeah, like that, onto a wire rack like this. They look amazing, don't they? <laughs> they look way more complex than they actually are. And hopefully we should be able to, just from a height, just generously pour chocolate onto these. Oh, that's more fun like that, look at that. I feel like a chocolate factory. There's obviously quite a lot on there, but let's just, let's go thick just in case is gonna encase in the marshmallow. So make sure it drips fully down the sides. But look, as I do it like that, just let it trench it. I did I say trench? Bye bye marshmallow. So they're certainly gonna be more rough and rustic looking and my word of using rustic is always my way of getting out of something looking awful. Just tap away. Look at all that chocolate we've collected. Of course we could reuse that. But look, they're all in case. So I'll keep tapping and then they're just gonna set. Amazing. So both our cookies so far are in the fridge, setting away lovely. It's smelling really, really good in here and I think it's gonna smell even mintier now because we are doing thin mints. Now, if you had a box of these on camp, you could pretty much bribe anyone, kids, adults, animals, to win a game of Stuck in the Mud or insert camp game there. They are insanely delicious chocolate cookies with a light snap coated in a peppermint chocolate outside layer. Absolutely bonkers. A few more base ingredients than the Samoa cookies, but not quite as fiddly to build. In this bowl right here is some plain flour again, uh, but we have got a new entrant to the bowl. It's uh, cocoa powder for obviously that chocolatey kit. We've got some baking powder, but also this time some corn flour, AKA cornstarch. Uh, many, the translation when I was in America, Cornstarch was probably a very mild one. We used to make something called oobleck. That was really fun. Uh, and some salt. As we found out recently, corn flour can help make cookies more tender. So uh, we're all for adding some of that in there. So I don't know why I'm deciding to use one of uh, Hedwisk's arms, or well, should it be wings, uh, to just whisk that through very delicately to incorporate it together. I mean, just use a whisk. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, guess who's back, back again, head whisks back, tell a friend. Uh, softened butter again, so very similar to before. However, we've now got some dark brown sugar in here as well, which we're gonna cream with softened butter and standard sugar too. So as you can see, just a bit more flavor and depth going on. There we go, that's looking good. But like we're saying, there's more depth to this. Like for example, we've got an egg. We're gonna help bond it more, especially more with an extra egg yolk too. And we normally have mint extract in the house, but this is actually peppermint extract. I bought this bottle today. Look, it literally says on the bottle, American peppermint extract. And it does have a slightly different waft to it than the normal mint extract. And it's made it smell amazing already. I just, I just smell mint and this just should be green. Maybe I should get the green food dye out. Beautiful. 
So what we're gonna do is gradually add in our dry ingredients. So just a little bit at a time. I'm gonna try to do it in thirds, or maybe quarters, and try and get a quarter on my counter. <laughs> Yeah, and I've got to say that is fully combined, but it is really wet and even more delicate in some ways. There is no way that will make cookies looking like that right now. However, we can help it. Okay, so this is about half of the dough mixture, and this is some baking parchment cut roughly the size of my large baking tray. We could have done this with the other one too, but we can roll it out between the baking parchment to get it nice and thin. Alrighty, yeah, that's cool. But look, even with that, it wants to stick to baking parchment. That's how temperamental it is. I mean, it's a pretty quirky shape. It doesn't matter. This time I'm gonna stick it in the freezer to lock in that shape, and hopefully it'll make stamping it nice and easy. Other than the small recipe, you can see that the other two are very, very similar. But even alone, when I'm making that dough, it always felt the strength that the egg was giving it. It was a little bit smoother, but it felt like it wanted a bond more. The first dough was a bit more crumbly, but either way, I think all three of these, and I was so tempted them to taste the others, but I think we'll have one big finale at the end. We're gonna lock that in so it will stamp well. It's gone way past my lunchtime. It's been a long old day, but I'm really, in it's actually triggering memories. In fact, if you wanna know a random story about my time in America, if you Google Barry Lewis Ashland, cause it wasn't just me, me and some fellow lifeguards, we actually helped someone that went off a rope swing. It wasn't one of the students. We were like on a public reservoir. It was like a shared lake. And he like fell off a rope swing and like really hurt himself. And I remember looking up at the sky going, oh, it's okay, there's an air ambulance coming. And it was the TV helicopter that had got there before the actual air ambulance. Legitimate story, we made a splint out of like a beaver and a tree or something. It was, it was kind of scary. But also looking back, Lenny came in like a few weeks later to thank us. It was like, you're welcome, son. <laughs> that is a legit story though. It wasn't just me, it was a couple of us. And it was, um, it's pretty scary. Okay, so I've just got that out of the freezer and it's kind of gone a bit rigid, but we'll go with it and just hopefully peel this back a little easier. Oh, there we go. I'm not so worried if it has got a little bit of a rise in it, but we've got a crinkle cut stamper here. That's not actually the official term, is it? Crinkle cut stamper. But we can see how that's holding that shape really well. Actually, I've got enough time to put it onto something nice and fresh as well. So a new seal pat. Although I can feel already that they are getting quite softened. So again, like before, this is like the leftover dough. So I've only used a quarter so far. I've got another half remaining, but this should be able to go on there. I've got so many cookies today, this will be enough. I'll keep the rest in the fridge. I actually do like the like slightly bit more attention to detail with the crinkle cut edges. However, it's gonna get coated in chocolate anyway. Slightly harder to tell when they'll go golden brown, but roughly 10 minutes should be enough. So even just from making that dough and bringing it out and putting it in the oven there, there's this whole like waft of mint extract already in here, just from that one teaspoon amount, that's crazy. And we're gonna need some more because that's getting coated again in a chocolate coating. So I might as well get that ready now. Another batch of melted dark chocolate there. It's been quite chocolate heavy, hasn't it? I mean, as you guys know, I don't, I don't mind that. And we know how potent this extract is, this mint. Oh my gosh, it smells like a forest. And they're gonna get rolled around in here. And here they are, out of the oven. And I'm gonna literally drop in one of our cooled cookies. So mint and chocolate mint on top of chocolate mint together. Yeah, that makes sense. Lift it out, shake it off a little bit. If you're not happy, or if you just wanna keep doing it forever, you can. <laughs> I might just do this all day. There we go, look at all of them. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And obviously again, we did a custom size. I've made them slightly larger. Oh my word. <laughs> then you get, I mean, they're probably almost double the size, but that's the great thing about making them homemade. They smell incredible. They need to set, which is no surprise compared to the other two we've done today. But now we can finish with the ultimate finale, once they set, of trying our three homemade, ooh, minty, Girl Scout cookies. Should we have a taste then? And like I said, it is quite a warm day in here. So if I am holding them and they get a little bit melted, we've got to give it a little bit of slack. Um, but once they are fully, fully set and it's a normal day, you can keep them in a room temperature uh, sealed container by, uh... oh, yeah, speaking of room temperature, I just took the thumbnail with these ones. So they are actually <laughs> quite warm. They might run off anyway, but look how good they look. That is outstanding. It looks like some sort of glorified donut. Uh, the back is coated fairly well. We missed a little bit there, but that's, we'll give it slack. You never look at the bottom of it when you're eating it, right? In fact, yeah, look, that is literally melting right now. <laughs> Here we go. Mmm. Oh. Oh. Phenomenal. As warm it is on the outside with the melted chocolate on my fingers, that topping was 
ice cold. I can tell you, on summer camp, a cooler box would not have gotten like that. <laughs> I've never had one of those cold before, and that is beautiful. The dark chocolate is kind of gripping it all together, and then you've got that hidden caramel layer on top of the biscuit, and the biscuit alone, I had a little off cut, they're nice and delicate and gorgeous. Absolute stonk, that is a really, really strong start. Blimey. All right, second up is the small one, which is really, really light, as it's set this one, some of the marshmallow has poured out, but that's fine. What I want to look at is the niece. <laughs> Ooh, that filling. Yeah, that is so much lighter than the other cookie. So you've got the chocolate, the biscuit, the marshmallow biscuit and chocolate. No mint, no flavoring, simple three ingredients. Although you could use a flavored chocolate. And out of all of them, this was definitely the easiest and the quickest to make. Mmm. Oh. Mmm. The inclusion of those biscuits was a nice, sorry, a really nice touch. Of course they weren't graham crackers, but these didn't dissolve. They're quite rigid biscuits. Graham crackers probably would have had a bit more snap and maybe slightly more flavor. But just that concept alone of encasing marshmallow sandwich in biscuit, oh my word. And these are ones that I never ever tried, so I don't know how they compare to the actual real ones, but they'll definitely do. All right, and these are Thin Mints, who are very thin and very firm because I've actually just put them in the freezer for a minute. Now uh, we cut these, you're not really gonna see much, but you are gonna get that sort of chocolate middle biscuit with that coating all around and a distinct stench, in a good way, of mint. Oh, oh. I think out of that one and the first one, that is the closest I remember to the true taste. Like a really strong mint vibes, the lovely snap and crunch, and a real sort of melt in your mouth. I feel like I've just eaten an entire mint plant, <laughs> but that's that sort of kick that you get. I think out of the two doughs, this one's slightly more rigid and easier to shape and make. Oh, I don't know which one was my favorite one. It's kind of like visually the first, simplicity the second small one, and the thin mint, the third one, was probably the nicest actually rewarding taste-wise. Damn. I'll just let you decide. I will type all of the recipes up in my own words with some conversions and maybe give some suggestions to what you could add to it. Thanks so much for watching. Give them a try. And if you do, let me know which one you like. I'll see you later. Ciao.